um, to give it, uh, to give us this grand rounds talk today on um, genetics and dilated cardiomyopathy. So Neil uh, received his uh, training um, in, of internal medicine at Columbia University and where he also served as chief resident, subsequently did his uh, heart fair, I mean, cardiology fellowship along with heart, advanced heart fair fellowship at Brigham Women's Hospital, uh, where he also received his degree in MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health. He uh, subsequently stayed on as faculty uh, within the advanced heart fair group um, and his uh, research interests uh, besides um, cardiomyopathy focuses on um, cardiovascular genetics uh, for which he has published uh, multiple papers uh, in high impact journals, uh, looking at uh, various forms of cardiovascular genetics uh, uh, disease, uh, including Lambin cardiomyopathy. Um, you know, aside from uh, all of his academic endeavors, Neil also serves as the uh, program director at the Advanced Heart Fair Fellowship, and he was my program director uh, when I did my, my Advanced Heart Fair Fellowship training up there uh, two years ago. And uh, again, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome him today, and we're looking forward to his talk. Bill, thanks a ton. And Gabby, thanks for uh, inviting me. It's a huge honor to kick off the new year. And I'll try to keep this topic clinically relevant. I know if you put genetics in a slide, it generally induces a soporific response, but um, I'll mostly just beat on Phil to keep it interesting. So here are my disclosures relevant to today's talk. I have some unrestricted um, foundation funds for genetic cardiomyopathies and have modest consulting income um, in the world of genetic cardiomyopathy. Um, but most relevant, um, I think you all know, having trained him in general cardiology, Phil Lamb was a Jedi before we had the opportunity to work with him in Boston. So here's an overview for today's presentation. I'll, I'll try to put it in context by starting with an epidemiology of dilated cardiomyopathy and the frequency of familial and genetic disease therein. Um, the majority of the talk will follow um, a, uh, a, a structure of discussing the major genetic subtypes and how knowledge of that should impact clinical management today. And within that, I'll embed some ruminations for emerging therapies that really get specific or um, uh, work towards this goal of precision medication. So it turns out the uh, population science for dilated cardiomyopathy is pretty bad. Um, we, we, if we were to apply the, the, the definition that we all know and love from Harrison's or from Brownwald, it's unexplained systolic dysfunction and LV dilation for which other obvious causes have been excluded. And depending on which review article you read or which version of the AHA heart disease and stroke statistics you read, you'll find incident data from uh, four to eight per 100,000 100, patient years in the US, slightly better incident data in Sweden of five per 100,000 patient years, um, it gets frustrating when you look at prevalent data with um, a logfold difference in US estimates of one in 250 to one in 2,500 individuals with DCM with a general sense that the population prevalence is higher in Africa and lower in Japan. And the best data that we have comes from Olmstead County. That's a cartoon of Minnesota. And Olmstead County, of course, the home of the Mayo Clinic is not such a random place and patients who have an echo generally don't have them for random reasons. And, and you know, I think in spite of best efforts, most of our population data for DCM are flawed related to ascertainment bias. But I think it remains unequivocally relevant because um, those of us who work in the heart failure world deal with this every day and recognize this as a fairly common disease. And if you were to take the perspective of patients who can um, participate in clinical trials, <coughs> Uh, pharmacotherapy for um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 30 to 40% of them will generally meet a diagnosis of DCM. Amongst patients admitted with acute heart failure in the setting of systolic dysfunction, one recent study cited 47% with DCM. And then if you go the whole way and you need a cardiac replacement with a transplant, um, 40 to 50% in some series have DCM. So it's very relevant, even if we don't know the total impact on at the population level. Um, and I think that the last 30 years have made a fairly compelling case that if you look hard enough, so-called idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy is usually familial. And um, at least when I was in medical school, this um, estimate was pretty low and it reflected the methodology of the era where um, 
basically some well-meaning fellow would review charts and say, well, in the charts of patients with DCM that I reviewed, 2% of them had familial disease. And I think we all recognize the limitations of that method. When um, the world of DCM and cardiomyopathy <clears throat> started to learn from um, medical genetics and started working with, um, with uh, genetic counselors, and putting together three generation family trees, we learned that up to a quarter of so-called idiopathic DCM was familial. And if we went ahead and echoed the first degree family members that we asked about in our family history, up to 40% of so-called idiopathic cases were familial. And from studying these families, we recognized that the inheritance pattern was typically autosomal dominant and that penetrance was age dependent with variable clinical expression such that most people who um, ultimately were affected had normal hearts early in life and the magnitude of disease could vary quite dramatically. When we um, take a, a stock of how we're doing as a clinical community in recognizing familial disease, I'd argue that we're mostly still in that retrospective chart review era where it takes a patient to tell us that I've got familial disease and at a place like MedStar or um, Brigham or other large um, academic medical centers, I think we're pretty good about asking about family history and maybe um, 10 to 25% of the time we're getting it. But what we're really hoping to do is be a little bit more pointed in our family evaluations. And there are a number of obstacles, both policy level and then also, frankly, the time that it takes to achieve that. And I think one of the reasons that as a clinical community, we haven't gone hard after it is that for the most part, once we make a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, the therapies don't change that much or historically have not changed that much when we go the extra mile with either a familial diagnosis or even a genetic diagnosis. Um, with a few important exceptions, medical therapy and device therapy is essentially the same as it is for other causes of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the emerging difference relates to device therapy. So, specifically defibrillators and um, resynchronization therapy. And um, perhaps the only guideline level recommendation for precision in the therapy we offer to a patient with DCM based on a genetic diagnosis was um, published in 2018 in the ACCHA um, uh, HRS VT management guidelines, which called out a specific risk stratification uh, tool for patients with Lehman cardiomyopathy, which I'll touch on later. And I think further underscoring the, the gradual uptake of um, a careful family history or even utilization of genetic testing in practice has been an alphabet soup of potential genetic malefactors. And I think this can be both intimidating, but also can take our eyes off the prize by creating a little bit too much going on when perhaps we could focus. Um, this is a cartoon taken from a very old review paper that remains quite relevant because it points out all the potential um, proteins whose genes have been implicated as a cause if mutated in dilated cardiomyopathy. And unlike say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that Tim Wong will be speaking about later, which is generally recognized as a disease of the sarcomere, in DCM we have many different um, uh, mechanistic explanations from sarcomere dysfunction, cytoskeletal dysfunction, nuclear envelope involvement, um, and even um, elements important in uh, RNA processing. Um, and depending on your uh, level of, of uh, scrutiny up to 100 plus disease genes have been implicated in the mechanism of DCM. And again, I think this uh, has distracted us from really focusing on the most likely explanations. Uh, about a decade ago, um, through the advent of next generation sequencing, we were able to show that the majority of genetic DCM that has been genetically identified is caused by a truncating variant in the giant gene Titan. Titan is the biggest gene and it encodes a huge protein. And the reason it hadn't previously been identified was our, our methodology vis-a-vis -vis Sanger sequencing just wasn't um, powerful enough to take it on. But since then, it's been recognized that about one fourth of familial cases and uh, maybe one fifth of sporadic cases of DCM are caused by truncating variants in Titan. So in, in the face of this um, increasing uh, complexity and maybe um, more diversity than really bear scrutiny, a number of important papers have um, adopted and really applied 2020 methodology to uh, identifying which disease genes we should really 
focus on. So this is a paper that was published last year in circulation from uh, the Royal Brompton Group in London. And it's essentially a massive case control study. So they put together two case cohorts, DCM cohorts, and they um, used two control cohorts. Their case cohorts included um, a primary cohort of patients that they enrolled prospectively at their institution and carefully phenotyped with dilated cardiomyopathy. And that was 1,040 patients. The secondary um, disease cohort were patients who were referred to a reference lab for genetic testing for dilated cardiomyopathy. For controls, they used both a population they longitudinally enrolled at the Brompton, and then they used the, exa uh, the, the exact data set, which is now more or less the NOMAD data set of um, individuals who had participated in exome level sequencing, um, uh, free of in, or not enriched with Mendelian disease. And then they performed a case control where they looked at the frequency of variants in these disease genes versus what they saw in um, their control populations. And they looked, they broke it down in a few different ways. So first they looked specifically at non-truncating variants. So these are single um, base pair um, substitutions that result in amino acid switch, a missense mutation, but not massive um, effect on the, the final protein. And they only found that a handful in their um, primary cohort uh, of genes were enriched. So this was in troponin T and myosin heavy chain. And um, when they looked at truncating variants, they found, uh, again, just a handful in Lamin, BAG3, DSP. When they looked at the secondary cohort, so these are now on the case uh, y-axis um, individuals who were referred for clinical genetic testing, they added a few more disease genes um, in the non-truncating or missense variants and then the truncating variants. So we went from over 100 putative disease genes to a handful, nine, and what's not included in here was Titan, which was essentially off the charts. And so I think the authors were um, appropriately careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that none of those 100 plus disease genes are relevant. But I think they fairly um, concluded that, um, that the uh, population burden of those other uh, disease genes may not be nearly as important as the ones included here. So it turns out that these are mostly sarcomere uh, encoding genes, so those that encode the, mus the uh, motor, uh, molecular motor of the heart. So this is a pie chart that um, puts into context what we know from um, works such as that. If you were to take a group of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, perform genetic testing, um, the majority of the explained genetic causes are due to truncating variants in Titan. And then we'll look separately at sarcomere, lamin, and DSP, which have all stood um, fairly high scrutiny for being um, disease causing and have shown up in multiple um, cohorts. So I'll start with Titan truncating variants. And <clears throat> after the initial identification of truncating variants Titan as a cause of DCM, there was of course a flurry of studies trying to understand why mutations in Titan um, cause dilated cardiomyopathy. And here's a cartoon that I think most of us know well from um, years of cardiology practice of the um, cardiac sarcomere with the thick filaments and thin filaments sliding across one another. Um, Titan occupies a role um, spanning the entire length of the sarcomere and we think provides some passive um, uh, spring to the sarcomere apparatus and probably plays a major role in assembling the sarcomere and providing structural integrity. And in this um, work uh, by Travis uh, Henson, who's uh, now at UConn at the time um, in the Seidman lab at, at the Brigham, um, he used um, induced, induced pluripotent stem cells to study the effects of Titan truncating variants on, on uh, muscle function and showed less spontaneous force generation um, less response to increases in preload and um, less response to beta adrenergic stimulation. So in a sense, a weaker sarcomere. Um, uh, recently, so this was, I guess, no longer in press, but just recently published in circulation, um, a group in uh, Germany uh, performed LV biopsies in patients with um, stage C heart failure and genetic um, confirmed etiology, something we don't do a lot of or, or really at all in the US, but um, is more common practice in, in Europe, especially Germany. And they were able to 
uh, examine patterns of, um, of uh, gene expression in the tissue from uh, pat patients with either Titan or Lehman related cardiomyopathy and essentially showed distinct transcriptomic profiles um, in Titan mutating mutated um, samples compared to others, which implicated uh, an increase in um, cell death pathways and fibrosis and downregulation hypertrophy pathways. So where does that leave us from a clinical perspective? So these cells generate less force, they may be less resilient. Um, if you were to just look broadly and compare patients with truncating variants in Titan to those who don't have one, um, the outcomes are pretty similar. And as I see it, these patients kind of look like generic DCM with a few key exceptions. So this is from that original New England Journal paper where we compared um, freedom from death or transplant or VAD in patients who had a truncating variant in Titan and those who did not. And these curves are pretty similar with, um, at least in this cohort, the median age of disease onset um, after 40 years, no, I'm sorry, median age of um, heart endpoint after 40 years of age in both groups. Uh, a couple of European groups have looked a little more carefully here and um, shown that that doesn't really tell the whole story. And whereas um, differences in um, progression to end stage heart failure um, and a composite of outcomes doesn't really uh, differ between truncating variant carriers and those who don't, um, they did show an increased burden of arrhythmias in patients with truncating variants in Titan compared to those who don't. This is a story that's still being told and I think hasn't yet reached the point where it's clear that it should be used in things like sudden death risk stratification or coming up with a program to screen for atrial fibrillation. Um, but what I think has borne out both anecdotally and what I see and what others have reported is that Titan related DCM is quite responsive to medical therapy. And um, uh, one of the misconceptions that a lot of patients have and even some of my colleagues have is, well, if it's genetic disease, it's invariably going to progress and there's not much that we can do about it. And um, I think this figure tells a different story. So again, from a European collaborative where they looked at 45 Titan um, DCM cases, uh, these are demonstrated by the black bar on the curve on this uh, figure. Um, they compared them to idiopathic DCM. These were 60 individuals who were genetically tested with no cause identified. And then as a straw man, 29 who had Lehman cardiomyopathy, something I'll turn to a little later in the talk, and found that um, uh, the Titan truncating carriers were very treatable, meaning that with medical therapy, they had stable LV systolic uh, uh, function. And um, nearly 50% were reversible with medical therapy, not language that we usually use. This is essentially a, a, a definition they uh, use for reverse remodeling, where nearly 50% of patients had an improvement in EF of greater than 10% or 10 points with medical therapy. And I, 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 I say anecdotally, this um, is very in line with what I've seen in my Titan related DCM cases. Another thing that uh, more recently we've learned is that Titan uh, mutations show up in all sorts of patients where we thought we knew why they had DCM or we thought we knew the whole story. Um, about one in 10 women with peripartum cardiomyopathy have a truncating variant in Titan. And at least in a clinical setting, taking a family history wasn't predictive of which uh, women would have a truncating variant in Titan. Those who did were actually less likely to recover after one year postpartum. Um, about one in 10 patients with alcoholic cardiomyopathy had a truncating variant in Titan. And here, um, the family history was predictive and a careful review suggested that uh, some of these patients with so-called alcoholic cardiomyopathy actually had been drinking less compared to the other patients in that cohort, suggesting a second hit. And then uh, perhaps the other um, acquired cause we're pretty familiar with besides alcohol is cancer therapy induced cardiomyopathy. And this is uh, predominantly related to anthracycline exposure where 8% in a recent series were related to a, a truncating variant in Titan. And these were individuals who were less likely to recover and more likely to have atrial fibrillation, um, arguing that um, it, it's something that should be considered even when we think we know the etiology and perhaps it's operating through a multiple hit pathway. So I'll transition now to other sarcomeric causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. So these are uh, genes such as alpha or TPM1, which encodes alpha tropomycin, MYH7, which encodes mycin heavy chain, and then two troponin encoding genes, 
um, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, um, a, a, a group of genes known to be mutated um, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where interestingly, they increase cardiac um, sarcomere function. So these are actually hyperactive sarcomeres. Um, whereas the, the um, sarcomeres with DCM mutations have the opposite pattern um, in in vitro studies. So this is a fairly old figure um, looking at um, different uh, in vitro models of sarcomeric function, either the sliding velocity of thin against thick filament, the maximal force generation, or the rate of ATPase turnover. And in general, the uh, HCM causing mutations caused enhanced motor function, whereas those that caused DCM were associated with depressed motor function. And um, this led to a hypothesis that these very fundamental prox proximate um, effects on sarcomere function may ultimately drive differences in phenotype. And this is something um, that we studied using strain imaging. This was a um, project I did uh, with uh, Carolyn Ho, uh, initially as a fellow um, in, with her as my mentor. And we uh, put together a, a population or a cohort of individuals who had either sarcomeric dilated cardiomyopathy um, here, these are all individuals with, with a myosin mutation. Individuals who had a sarcomere gene mutation that causes DCM, but at present had normal systolic function vis-a-vis -vis normal EF and no evidence of LV dilation. And then their um, family members who didn't have the mutation and who had normal um, uh, cardiac uh, function by 2D echo. And we did um, longitudinal strain and strain rate uh, along with circumferential radial and tissue Doppler imaging. And here are some representative images from um, three individuals from this study showing that strain imaging identified differences in systolic function in the mutation carriers with normal 2D echo that um, sort of eluded our eyes. And when we um, put it together um, and looked at the entire cohort, it wasn't just strain imaging, but um, even good old fashioned tissue Doppler imaging, which was able to identify um, subclinical evidence of systolic dysfunction in the sarcomere mutation carriers who had normal 2D echo. Um, when we compare this to our patients who had sarcomere mutations associated with HCM, we essentially recapitulated what um, had been seen in um, isolated uh, muscle studies or in um, in vitro studies, whereas um, in DCM causing sarcomere mutations, we see a depression in systolic function without a measurable change in diastolic function. Whereas in um, preclinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, individuals with a sarcomere mutation associated with HCM, but without LVH on 2D echo, there was no change in systolic function, but a depression in diastolic function. Um, we, we also, around this time, were interested in the clinical characteristics of um, individuals from families with um, uh, sarcomeric DCM. Um, does it behave like, say, tight DCM, which shows up later in life? And so uh, with Beth McNally, who at the time was at the University of Chicago, we put together two um, families who had the same mutation in alpha tropomyosin um, and achieved a very high LOD score, uh, confirming uh, that this um, mutation was um, the cause of disease. Um, and we looked at a few different measures of disease um, uh, severity. So one is penetrance. So how likely it was that patients were with the sarcomere gene mutation were to develop TCM. And we can see that the median um, age of disease onset was in um, the 20s or 30s in this patient population, in this cohort, um, with an interesting drop off very early in life. So a good number of these individuals developed DCM as infants or as toddlers. Um, and some of the worst outcomes actually occurred there. So in red is freedom from death or cardiac transplantation. And we can see some attrition in the first years of life, teenage years, but then some clinical stability thereafter. And our take home from this was, you know, if we identify sarcomeric DCM in a patient, and I, I, I specifically mean non-Titan DCM, we should um, ensure that the, the children of our patients or the, the um, child relatives of our patients should commence screening early in life. It shouldn't sort of follow the, the use that we do in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where we often take a casual approach to screening until adolescence. So um, both Titan and these other classic sarcomere genes are associated with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And in parallel, there have been 
a lot of therapeutics that have been developed specifically to target the sarcomere. So um, should we think specifically about activating sarcomeric function in patients who have sarcomere-related DCM? If the fundamental and proximate um, uh, dysfunction in this disease is that force generation is reduced, should we try to counteract that? And I think that's compelling and it's actually um, made uh, uh, possible because of drugs like omacamptive and now danacamptive in its, uh, in its uh, wake, uh, which are essentially drugs that increase um, uh, the duration of force generation at the level of the sarcomere. And um, with, with these drugs available and with this um, knowledge of mechanism in mind, um, we've launched a phase two study of a drug called danacamptive, very similar to omacamptive, which was the subject of the galactic trial. And the idea here is not so much to show that patients who receive this drug in the setting of genetic DCM um, uh, have much better heart outcomes. Of course, that's the long-term goal. But really the idea is more basic. Um, are patients with dysfunctional sarcomeres more responsive to therapies which um, modulate sarcomeric function? And so in this open label study with one dose adjustment, we'll take patients with uh, DCM related to um, a myosin mutation or a titan mutation and um, uh, determine how the dose response between this drug and systolic ejection time and query whether these patients are more responsive to therapies than the generic um, patient in HEFREF trials receiving uh, myosin activators. And, uh, I think this is an important first step to um, realizing some precision therapies for sarcomeric related dilated cardiomyopathy. So um, we, this is a study that was launched um, uh, in the uh, late summer, early fall of 2020, which um, had been sort of hampered by uh, COVID, but um, now a few sites are up in the US besides ours and several sites in Europe. And um, I think the, the, the hope is that there will be um, some uh, uh, greater availability, um, including in the DC area with colleagues like yourself in the near term. So I'm gonna shift gears away from sarcomeric um, causes of dilated cardiomyopathy to lamin-related cardiomyopathy, um, which accounts for about 5% of genetic DCM. Um, very broadly speaking, um, lamin is decidedly not a sarcomere gene. It's um, LMNA encodes two proteins, lamins A and C, which provides structural integrity to the uh, nucleus. And this is felt to be key for mechanotransduction and gene expression. And in isolated cells and animal models, um, uh, uh, cells with mutated lamin exhibit um, nuclear fragility. They don't do well with mechanical stress. Um, and this seems to activate pathways that are ultimately um, destructive, culminating in apoptosis. So um, that 5% um, uh, of DCM related to DCM, uh, in, related to lamin mutations that I noted has been seen in a number of cohorts, um, uh, both early Italian experiences, um, one from Ray Hirschberger's group, one that we put together, or two that we put together, and then uh, a more recent one from uh, Europe. And consistently, if you look at a DCM cohort, about four to eight percent of individuals will have a mutation in lamin. These are generally a mix of missense and non-missense variants. And when when it was available, um, the yield of uh, a lamin mutation was much higher if there was associated conduction disease or a higher burden of arrhythmia. Something that I'm going to turn to in a moment. Um, when we looked a little bit more carefully and tried to separate adults from children, um, we, we found that if you look at specifically an adult population with uh, DCM, about 7% will have a lamin mutation, whereas it's non-existent in infants and pretty uncommon in pediatric uh, populations. So like other genetic causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, mutations in lamin are dominant and they're associated with age-dependent penetrance uh, unlike other genetic causes of cardiomyopathy, penetrance is very high and this uh, approaches 100% in most studies. Um, beyond high penetrance, um, the clinical expression of lamin-related heart disease is pretty distinctive. This is not generic DCM. Um, so this is a study we put together with um, colleagues um, in France, and we've 
um, looked at 122 Lamin mutation carriers from five centers. And um, of this, there were 87 probands. So the rest were relatives who came in um, through their probands. Just to give you a context, about 8% of these patients had an associated muscular dystrophy, which is a well-described phenomenon in Lehman-related heart disease. And on this figure, I show the, the time of onset of the different phenotypes associated with Lehman mutations in this patient population. So on the y-axis, we go from AV block to atrial arrhythmias, thromboembolism, heart failure, really LV systolic dysfunction, ventricular arrhythmias, end-stage heart failure, and death. And then on the x-axis is the age at which point an individual patient experienced this. And um, a patient generally could be depicted on multiple points here. So a patient could have had AV block at say age 30, atrial arrhythmia is at 40, and then um, died um, at age 70, according to this rubric. And we saw a general trend where the milder phenotypes occurred earlier, AV block and atrial arrhythmias, uh, whereas ventricular arrhythmias and stage heart failure and of course death um, were later in life. Um, and with that much um, diversity, one of the important first questions was how, how rapidly do some of these more um, ominous or more um, uh, important phenotypes develop? And so uh, as a heart failure doc, of course, I was focused on um, heart failure. And so we looked at it two different ways. These patients were followed for a median of seven years and the range was three to eight years, the, the uh, 25 and 75th um, confidence intervals. And um, progression to end-stage heart failure amongst patients who did not have end-stage heart failure when we first met them was about 25% over a modest period of follow-up. And then even in patients who had no, normal systolic, uh, systolic function when we first met them, new heart failure or systolic dysfunction occurred um, in 25% of them over that same period of time. And 7% of patients with hitherto normal systolic function um, developed end-stage disease over that short period of time. So this was a uh, relently, relentlessly progressive disorder. Um, these are uh, similar data from Christina Hagua's group um, in Norway, where she um, put together a cohort of patients with Lehman cardiomyopathy and just dichotomized them based on their systolic function at baseline and showed that really any LV systolic dysfunction was associated with um, the development of end-stage heart failure in this patient population. But you'll see a lot of events um, even in the uh, group with initially preserved systolic function. And this was a figure I'd shown earlier to demonstrate how treatable and reversible Titan-related DCM and um, the straw man, as mentioned, was Lehman cardiomyopathy, which is generally not treatable. And this is with you know, our more or less contemporary era GDMT, maybe without as much um, entresto utilization or really without it, and, and virtually no reversibility. So um, this is a disease from a heart failure perspective that um, seemed to be unrelenting. Um, the other reason it has our attention is the associated burden of ventricular arrhythmias. So on this messy figure, we showed the time, um, essentially a, a, an incident curve for different phenotypes amongst individuals who didn't have them when we first met them. So in red is the, the onset of ventricular arrhythmias who at the first clinical contact had none. And you'll can see that if you follow them long enough, virtually all of these patients would go on to develop either sustained VT or ventricular fibrillation or have associated sudden death. So our group and others have looked at risk factors for sustained VT or ventricular fibrillation in this, this patient population, uh, male sex, um, LV systolic dysfunction of really any magnitude and the type of mutation. So a structural mutation, a non-missense mutation um, have been shown to identify patients at risk for um, sudden death or um, uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias. Um, importantly, another way of thinking about this is that uh, if we think about the usual made it to kind of criteria for when a defibrillator, defibrillator might be useful. Um, in Lamb and cardiomyopathy, most patients experiencing malignant arrhythmias have them with an EF greater than 35% and over a quarter have them with essentially preserved systolic function. Um, and then um, as noted earlier, if we look at the other endpoint development of end-stage um, heart failure, um, the only thing that's been turning up in um, 
models have been is the presence of systolic dysfunction at baseline. So we, we were interested um, in um, getting a little bit deeper with the ventricular arrhythmias in Lehman cardiomyopathy. So this is a study I did with one of um, Phil's um, co-fellows, Kieran Sidhu, who did yeoman's work of um, digging through um, all ICD interrogations from 43 Lehman cardiomyopathy patients that we followed. And um, she was uniquely positioned to do this having, having trained in both EP and heart failure. Um, and so a few things stood out in this study. So um, the first is um, we, we thought they were fairly representative of this disease. They were split between patients who received a primary and a secondary prevention device, more with a primary prevention device who were followed for a reasonable three and a half to 4.9 years and were in their 40s at the time of their first visit with um, moderate systolic dysfunction at baseline. Uh, in these 43 patients, um, 26 patients received ICD therapies with a total of 451 ICD therapies with annualized IVT rates of uh, three per 100 patient years in the primary prevention group and 28 per 100 patient years in the secondary prevention group. And so against these 451 appropriate ICD therapies for VT, there were only two inappropriate shocks, one lead fracture and one episode of um, ICD therapy for um, supraventricular arrhythmia. And it's not because we're that good at programming defibrillators at the Brigham, it's because AV block is so common in this patient population that the usual mechanism for inappropriate um, therapies did not occur. Um, this was a, a figure she put together to um, depict the diversity of VTs experienced in this patient population. And so on the y-axis, we have essentially each different um, tachycardia cycle length. Um, and on the um, x-axis is the tachycardia cycle length in milliseconds. And so um, these would be essentially really slow VTs at the top, and these would be really fast VTs at the bottom. And um, the efficacy of anti-tachycardia pacing really struck us in this patient population. So overall, 94% of the time that it was utilized, ATP was effective at terminating VT. And the efficacy was extremely high in all patients with a cycle length above 250. So these are essentially virtually anybody who had anything other than VF. And um, you know the, the take home for this is that we should be pretty liberal about programming ATP and these, these patients who have such a high burden of VT to spare them the trauma of repetitive ICD shocks. Um, and that it's not good enough to set it and forget it. Um, their VT evolves over time. So this figure is to depict the change in, in cycle length um, over uh, a median of three years in the patients with repeated VTs. And we can see that in general, VT slowed. And there are a number of uh, appropriate reasons that I'm sure you can all think of as to um, how this worked out. But again, um, working with our EP colleagues, our take home is that we should really carefully and thoughtfully revisit ICD programming when patients come back. Um, well, with all this VT, how well can we fix them in the cath lab and, or in the EP lab? And um, the, unfortunately, not so well. So this is a mess of a figure that's a mess to tell a story, which is that um, really, once you get to an EP lab for VT ablation with Lehman cardiomyopathy, you're in for a ride. And, and often it culminates in um, end-stage heart failure requiring a, a transplant of ED or um, dying related to end-stage heart failure. So of 25 patients that uh, were seen at the Brigham with um, for um, in the EP lab uh, referred for VT ablation, um, 22 of them had a recurrence, um, a first recurrence. Of those, 14 underwent a second procedure six, a third, and two, a fourth procedure. And you can see the number of people who um, received moderate control with antiarrhythmic drugs, but only to go on and develop an outcome. So there's not a lot of good um, news on this slide. And um, the, you know, another consideration that these data uh, really pointed us towards was the importance of really taking um, uh, heart failure therapies head on in these patients. So I'll often get a call from my EP colleagues saying we have a Lehman cardiomyopathy patient who are ablating. Um, we would like you to evaluate them for transplant, which is an appropriate recommendation, but um, with, with the exception of the highest burden of VT, we generally can't get someone straight to transplant just because we're worried about what the future has in store. Um, 
So um, this is work that um, Kieran again is helping to lead that asks a question of, well, what of CRT in this patient population? Might we be able to help um, improve natural or improve um, outcomes in patients with Lehman cardiomyopathy by uh, restoring some degree of physiologic ventricular activation? And so in a patient population that's very enriched with AV block that almost always ends up with a defibrillator and therefore the potential for V pacing, we thought this was a relevant target uh, for therapy and put together a multi-center cohort of um, over 110 patients with Lehman cardiomyopathy who had CRT. This is work that's in preparation. Um, we hope to have it in press soon. And um, in this patient population of mostly individuals in their 50s, um, uh, uh, mostly men, but a good number of women spread between missense and non-missense mutations with uh, mostly class one and two heart failure at baseline, but a good number with advanced heart failure, moderate to severe systolic dysfunction, and <clears throat> um, not so much dilation. We dichotomize them into responders and non-responders based on their magnitude of LVF improvement after CRT. And at baseline, the only predictors of response uh, were using this approach were the, the magnitude of LV systolic dysfunction. And so it turns out patients with worse EFs are more likely to respond. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is worth um, uh, uh, really focusing on was the amount of patients who had a therapy, a device therapy in place before they um, went on to CRT. Most of them with um, dual chamber um, or um, defibrillators or pacemakers, um, some with single chamber ICDs. Um, and it's relevant because in a disease with so much AV block, um, there are a lot of patients getting ventricular pacing um, from their devices prior to the CRT upgrade. And the other thing that stood up as a uh, predictor of CRT response were um, a high degree of ventricular pacing prior to um, upgrade. And so in a multivariable model, um, we found again, LV systolic, uh, this function was predictive uh, in a univariate uh, assessment, but really um, the per percent of ventricular pacing um, uh, was one that stood, all, stood out along with LVF pre-CRT as predictive of um, who would respond to CRT at six months. So essentially people who have any degree of systolic dysfunction and um, who are getting a lot of pacing from their device. Here and then look to see how patients did symptomatically and in general there was a trend towards improvements in their NYJ functional class. And importantly, um, when we looked at um, time to um, end-stage heart failure and dichotomized patients based on their CRT response, people who had a CRT response uh, not only had a higher EF uh, as that was the definition of a CRT response, but they um, lived longer and were less likely to need a transplant. So um, in, in putting all of this data in Lehman cardiomyopathy into context, we know that there's a lot of AV block in this patient population. And so I, I would, what I do is frequent um, ambulatory ECG monitoring in these patients. And once they uh, demonstrate that there's um, a complicated second degree or high grade um, AV block, we generally recommend placement of a transvenous um, device um, because A, they're gonna need a defibrillator and B, that defibrillator will need to provide ATP and our current sub-Q systems can't do that. And in light of this um, data that I've just shown, we would favor CRT placement if we anticipate a high burden of ventricular pacing. I haven't um, reviewed data that shows a very high risk of stroke amongst patients with Lehman cardiomyopathy and um, AFib, um, but uh, I think that's real. And uh, I don't use the chads vask uh, score in these patients. I just anticoagulate them and I bridge them when they come in for procedures. Um, and then as noted, um, their ventricular arrhythmia risk is very high and we should have a lower threshold for ICD placement. This is uh, sanctioned by um, the AHA, ACC, uh, HRS guidelines, utilizing the presence of um, these uh, risk factors. So two of these risk factors to support ICD placement. Um, and then um, I think uh, the bi-directional collaboration with my EP colleagues have really um, shown the value of referral to a heart failure program once these patients start to um, increase their burden of ventricular arrhythmia. So, you know, if you're seeing one of these patients in EP clinic and they're starting to get ICD therapies, maybe they should be re referred to Phil or Farouk for uh, 
for at least thinking about when they might need cardiac replacement. Well, that's a lot of doom and gloom. Um, and I think we can do a little bit better with how we use devices based on some of the data I showed. Um, and we can prevent strokes, but um, I think we have a lot to do to really prevent the development of end-stage heart failure. And there is some um, promise in um, some translational studies that uh, may lead the way. And so in animal models of Lehman cardiomyopathy, so specifically mouse models, um, uh, activation of a fairly generic uh, MAP kinase pathway has been shown early on in, um, in uh, disease uh, pathogenesis. And um, small molecule blockers of this pathway has been shown to prevent um, further systolic dysfunction in, um, in this case, mice with missense variants associated with Lehman cardiomyopathy. So in this mouse trial of um, four weeks of therapy in 16 week old mice, um, the mice who received placebo had a fractional shortening of 15% versus those who received a um, small molecule blocker of this path pathway um, had significantly higher fractional shortening. And um, this was um, specific uh, for the P38 MAP kinase pathway. So um, the availability of uh, such a therapy um, led to a phase two study that we participated in of um, 12 patients with Lehman um, cardiomyopathy who um, in an open label fashion received um, this therapy for um, uh, up to 48 weeks. And the Delta in six minute walk test was the primary outcome in this open label non-controlled study. Uh, we also looked at um, biomarkers and of course, um, cardiac remodeling. And what was seen was that there was a highly significant improvement in six minute walk test at four and 12 weeks. And um, you'll see on uh, the below the X axis that there are a number of patients who sort of dropped out um, for mostly the development of end stage heart failure. Um, and in that patient, in, in those who stayed in, their um, functional capacity remained preserved. Um, there was a modest decrease in NTBMP compared to before the study, and EFs came up in a dose dependent fashion. And this led to an ongoing phase three clinical trial of this drug in Lehman cardiomyopathy. Um, patients receive um, what was initially an array, but now a Pfizer product, 400 milligrams twice a day, or placebo. The primary um, outcome was actually change in six minute walk at 12 weeks. Um, patients are followed um, for that outcome at 24 weeks, but actually stay in the study thereafter on their randomly assigned therapy. So we can also uh, get a sense for how this therapy impacts much more relevant um, metrics of disease severity, such as um, biomarkers, uh, echo remodeling, and the hardest outcomes like survival free from um, hospitalization or end stage heart failure. This, this study is still enrolling and, and accepts patients with any degree of systolic dysfunction and associated heart failure or effort intolerance, a Lehman mutation, and they need to have a, uh, an ICD in situ and to be on stable medical therapy with the goal of enrolling 120 patients with class two or three heart failure. It was initiated in March um, of 2018, um, and as I mentioned, is open. And last, um, I just want to throw a little curveball that has been an interesting and fun story over the last few years, which is um, patients with DSP mutations. And uh, for the connoisseurs in the audience, you'll recognize DSP is encoding desboplakin, which is a desmosomal gene, one associated with ARVC. But it's not how it's really turned up in our clinics. Um, and often um, these patients come to me with an alternate diagnosis of myocarditis. So, um, uh, there uh, are now um, a number of publications, including one that we participated in that was led by um, Adam Helms at the University of Michigan, showing that patients with desmoplakin mutations predominantly present with an LV um, cardiomyopathy. This is not ARVC, but AL, ALVC at some level. And that up to a third of them may present clinically with what looks like myocarditis with pain often, uh, myocyte necrosis, up and down troponin um, uh, kinetics and inflammation even when we perform MRI or PET scanning, um, including in a handful who've had biopsies. It's important to recognize this because um, this is one of those genetic causes of DCM with a higher burden of ventricular arrhythmias that uh, I think should impact our decisions to offer primary prevention defibrillators. 
And interestingly, this is a diagnosis you can generally make just from um, meeting a patient and looking at them. Their hair and their skin on their palms and their soles generally tells the story. So here's a patient from um, our series where uh, years of um, pumicing, starting when she was a young woman, somewhat obscured what, what, what would have been extremely heavy callusing on her feet. And she had chemically straightened her hair, which was otherwise extremely curly. And you can see the midline sternotomy scar. She had had a transplant. And um, what this essentially is, is a cardiocutaneous syndrome caused by DSP mutations, which is autosomal dominant. So unlike Naxo syndrome associated with ARVC, which is recessive, this is a dominant disorder and um, can be identified simply by looking at the, the skin and the hair of your patient. So this was from one of those families that um, Adam Helms had um, uh, introduced us to it in Michigan um, in the last century. And unfortunately, you can look at this sepia tone or this black and white picture and see who ran into problems with cardiac arrest here, here, and here. And so if I put it all on one um, table, uh, I think that uh, this tells most of the story. So in genetic dilated cardiomyopathy, most of it is caused by titan truncating variants Importantly, other sarcomere gene mutations um, are implicated. And then Lamin and DSP account for um, a significant burden of the rest. Now, this isn't the whole story, but this is 80% uh, plus of our known story. Um, mechanisms differ. The burden, um, the population associated burden um, is depicted here. So what percentage of DCM cases can be linked to one of these? The age of onset varies quite a bit. Um, the penetrance of these gene mutations can be very low um, or very high. Uh, associated arrhythmias, especially atrial arrhythmias, are very common in lamin, maybe higher in titan, but maybe not more so in the others, whereas ventricular arrhythmias seem to be much higher in lamin and DSP. Um, conduction disease appears to be fairly specific for lamin mutations. And um, occasionally you get a tick, tip off, tip off from something outside of the heart, like skeletal myopathy and lamin cardiomyopathy, or curly hair and coarse calluses on the palms and soles in DSP cardiomyopathy. Um, so in conclusion, about 30 to 40% of DCM cases can, um, uh, through careful scrutiny, uh, a, a specific genetic cause can be identified. Truncating variants in Titan are the most um, important cause, at least from a um, population level. And Titan-related DCM uh, is an adult onset disease generally that responds to conventional medical therapy. Mutations in other sarcomere genes cause DCM, but importantly, uh, may present in infancy, so we should really be careful to screen family members early in life. Um, Lamin cardiomyopathy is more than just systolic dysfunction, but high risk, high rates of a cardiac arrest, stroke, and um, death from refractory heart failure, which should um, allow us to be careful about um, uh, preemptive therapies like defibrillators, um, anticoagulants, and CRT, along with referrals to colleagues in advanced heart failure. Um, DSP cardiomyopathy is an LV systolic dysfunction disease in most cases, which may present as myocarditis with curly hair and calluses. And I think importantly for our field and um, what something that's really exciting and gets me up uh, every morning is that there are phase two and phase three trials um, ongoing in this space. And we think there are many more to come. So I'll leave it there. Here are um, my uh, dear friends and collaborators with whom I've done a lot of this work or who I have benefited from years of mentorship or cl clinical collaboration with. And like I said, it's a huge honor to present and um, a thrill to reconnect with Phil and with Farouk and with other, other friends. Thanks, you. That, that was really a great uh, overview of a lot of information. Uh, the floor is open. You know, this is Alan Taylor. That was wonderful. I really. I uh, want to thank you for really opening up our eyes. And uh, this comes on top of the great work the group here's done. And Mark Hoffmeyer is one of our leads in dilated uh, genetic dilated cardiomyopathy. I had a question just about imaging beyond standard kind of clinical imaging with ultrasound. And are there other hallmarks? What other clinic are there other than the clinical clues, which I think are, I, I really enjoyed? Um, are there imaging hallmarks that we should be looking for to discriminate these or identify the genetic cardiomyopathy? And maybe that comes out on for instance, MR imaging? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, 
I start with an anecdote. So from one of my DSP cardiomyopathy families, <clears throat> I got a fairly frantic call from um, Raymond Kwong, one of my colleagues in cardiac MRI, when I sent a young woman down for an MRI. And he said, this woman has classic myocarditis. She has subepicardial circumferential late enhancement. Um, we're, so much so we're going to put this in the chart. And you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it turns out she, yeah, maybe she had myocarditis, but it's an underlying genetic disease. And it gets to what I think is a bit of a challenge of a lot of the imaging literature, which um, has taken such a 40,000 foot view and try to discriminate causes based on, I think somewhat crude um, uh, methods like patterns of late gadolinium enhancement. So I, I don't know that in 2021, we're ready to use MRI to say, this is the precise cause of this person's DCM, notwithstanding those cases of cardiac iron overload where, yeah, it's really good for that. Um, it's very good for discriminating ischemic from non-ischemic and might turn out to be a useful metric for response to therapy. But um, I, I haven't found it yet to provide the level of precision that you can get out of DNA sequencing. Um, hey, Neil, uh, this Steve Epstein here. It, it was a superb talk. Thank you so much. It's amazing how you were able to put together so much information. Um, I, I do have a sort of a specific question. The, uh, your data on the desmoplakin cardiomyopathy um, and its predisposition to myocarditis. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? How do we know, or do we know, that um, some of these um, uh, 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 entities might actually sort of predispose to a susceptibility to myocarditis, so that rather than being a primary dysfunction of cardiac myocytes or any of the components of the heart, it actually um, works into a dilated cardiomyopathy with, with its progressive downhill uh, uh, outcome as a result of progressive inflammation and, um, and myocarditis. Is there anything that um, would suggest that might in fact be the case? Uh, that's a super salient question, Dr. Epstein, and one that um, we're pursuing. So, you know, I think to underscore your observation and then to just sort of say it again, I don't think we could use a one size fits all mechanism for this disease. DCM is just such a generic pattern of remodeling that um, to assume that every patient with DCM is going to follow the same pathway, I think will do a disservice to our field. I think a lot of that classic ARVC figure that Hugh Calkins's group put together some 15 or 20 years ago, which depicted the stuttering um, uh, disease progression in that condition where people would heat up and then cool down, heat up and cool down. And that's what I see in these patients with DSP cardiomyopathy, which I think gives um, uh, a lot of credence to your idea that maybe it really is an inflammatory condition that's triggered by a DSP mutation. And our focus should be in understanding that inflammatory mechanism better because the therapies are gonna be awfully different. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, so there, we have a, a study afoot to try to get at this that's gonna include <laughs> comprehensive metabolomic proteomic profiling coupled with um, PET scanning in patients with DSP cardiomyopathy to try to understand whether we can actually measure the, the inflammation that we occasionally see on biopsy uh, in the blood. And, and I think, you know, others are much further along on this path, but have been focused on the RV. So Jeff Safitz, who's a cardiac pathologist at, um, at the Beth Israel Deaconess, um, has really been interested in inflammation and classic ARVC for a while now. So um, I think your points are um, spot on and really require further investigation so we don't get tunnel vision and treat all genetic DCM the same way. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Neil, it was really a, a great talk, and I just want to uh, build on Steve's question. Anyway, it's Bill Weintraub. Um, <clears throat> as I listen to this, it's just spectacular data, but, but the, the, the course of these patients is highly variable, and I, I wonder about two things. First of all, not everyone with, with any one of these have exactly the same genetic de defect. A after all, you say a, a mutation, but there are possibly multiple mutations within those genes. And then there's effect modification of several types. It could both be effect modification that's genetic, and there could be effect modification that's 
that's an that's an, an envir in, environmental. And I think Steve came up with sort of a, the perfect example of that. But I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about um, these particular issues of there are multiple entities, there are multiple ways of, of uh, in which there could be effect modification. And how can, how can we ever put it all together when there, there's so many complex things happening? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. And I think there's probably a, a huge award in there somewhere to understand why so-called single gene disorders are so variable. I think that there are a few ways that we can tackle this question. So, you know, if the first point that you made, which is really good, is that there are different mutations in these series. So, you know, most, most patients don't have the exact same gene mutation unless they happen to be relatives. Well, one way that we can start this um, investigation is by looking at people who have truncating variants and seeing if they behave mostly the same. So the idea is basically these are patients who are haploinsufficient. They just, they're down one copy of the gene. And um, that seems to be the case in LAM and that seems to be the case in Titan. And so it might allow us to at least start down the road of, of, of finding a patient population where their, their underlying genetic defect is the same. And then it's gonna to get to get, it, it sort of becomes like old school epidemiology. We need to put together large enough cohorts and develop good enough tools to understand what are the factors that then cause such variable clinical expression. And some of them I think are gonna be acquired. So in Titan, we've already seen that alcohol, pregnancy, anthracyclines are, are kind of another hit. And that makes sense. And it, again, was one of those things that sort of passes the sniff test. I'm sure you've all looked after families where it's, the uncle who drinks a lot who ended up with more cardiomyopathy earlier in life. But it's, by, it's far from the only explanation. And I think that it, it really forces us to be collaborative in our science. This won't be something that we can take on at one center, but we really need to take on at scale. And so what I haven't talked about, but is an effort led by my um, dear friend, Carolyn Ho, is um, the share registry where we have put together um, a registry of, of like-minded investigators uh, right now, focused on HCM with uh, nearly 10,000 patients um, uh, spoken for. So I think you're going to need that sort of scope and scale to then start asking, well, what about modifying genes? What about um, epigenetics? What about other environmental triggers that, that could drive differences in clinical expression? So I do think it's going to really come down to team science to, to um, get at some of the other things. You know, in that regard, you're probably aware that we're also running the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, re re registry, Absolutely. which includes uh, imaging, uh, and both Ray Kwong and Carolyn Ho are part of that as, uh, uh, as well. Um, but we only have 2,700 patients after a huge effort uh, and putting together population sizes large enough to get after all we need to get after. It's going to be quite a challenge for most of these diseases. I think it, I mean, I think it'll happen, but you look at coronary disease, um, some of the biggest insights took like 40,000, 50,000. Yeah, exactly. But we just have to, I mean, I think the good thing about HCMR is that um, it got people working together. And I, I think as long as we don't get too territorial, hopefully we can make some strides. Hey Neil, this is Aaron Waxman. Uh, thank you for a fabulous talk. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about electrical stimulation for these patients? Is there, there were recent uh, more case reports that you could actually revert the disease and is there any testing that can like, tell us which one would respond or not respond? I, I missed the, the second. So you said there was a recent um, study and that I missed what you'd said. There were some studies that were suggested that by electrical stimulation, you can reverse the course of the disease or at least mm -hmm. halt it or improve. I mean, do you find this believable or uh, is there any way that we can uh, detect who are the patients who would be candidate for electrical stimulation? Um, so, and, and Ron, are you referring to um, uh, sort of CRT or conduction system pacing or are you talking Particular about- Particular stimulation uh, that, that would be done. It doesn't have to be by not CRT devices, but active stimulation to make the cells maybe functioning more. Oh, interesting, yeah. I, I mean, I have to plead ignorance there. I, I, I need to read more about it. So um, 
I, I'd love to hear more about it if you if you wouldn't mind. Um, maybe. Yeah, there was a recent innovation that was presented in an Israeli meeting for a company from Germany. They have done about a series of 12 patients and they claimed that there was improvement in projection fraction, but I couldn't take much on their mechanism why this should work. So as an yeah. expert was asking you, but I'd be happy. Yeah, I, to I, I guess, yeah, I, I'd have to review it before I say anything, but um, thank you for bringing that up. Hey, Neil, this is Samir Najjar. Um, thank you very much. As everybody said, that was truly an excellent talk and really enjoyed it. Um, if I may, I would like to zoom out a little bit, um, zoom out of the sort of candidate genes. And I just want to get your thoughts about the role of GWAS for dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, is there a promise there? Is there a role there? What, what are you, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a really important question, Samir, and thanks for, for staying uh, with, with me for the whole talk. I, you know, our best efforts at using traditional panel-based approaches or using linkage analysis still leaves over 50% of DCM unexplained. And there have been GWAS for DCM and there have been some early hits. And I guess the question is really gonna to get to, is it ever gonna be, you know, for the rest of it, is it really gonna be one disease gene? Is it gonna be kind of a polygenic risk score type um, effect where um, in systolic dysfunction, it's a number of hits that ultimately accrue that cause um, your LV um, EF to drop. So I think that um, much like team science is gonna help us make sense of the modifying factors I think it, it will um, undoubtedly also provide us some um, uh, really proximate ins insights into what's causing disease. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, that was a great discussion. And again, uh, thank you, Neil, so much for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we'll post it on YouTube probably either tonight or tomorrow, so it'll be available for anybody that wants to see it offline or if somebody couldn't make it for all of it. Uh, we'll see everybody here next week for Tim Wong uh, talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you.